Welcome to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast for farmers and ag professionals by the Iowa Farm Bureau, bringing you the news, experts, and educational insights that matter most. Now, here's your host. Welcome to our November 29th edition of The Spokesman Speaks podcast. I'm Andrew Wheeler, and today we've got a packed episode with three guests. Iowa Farm Bureau President Craig Hill joins us to reflect on Farm Bureau's work as Craig heads into his final annual meeting as president. Dr. Wendong Zhang is going to tell us about the factors driving Iowa's rising farmland prices. And Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Mike Nag will join us to discuss an intriguing new grant program for farmers, businesses, and nonprofits with an application deadline that's coming up in mid-December. We'll start with President Craig Hill, whose service to Farm Bureau stretches all the way back to the early 1980s when he was serving on the Warren County Board. Over the past decade, he's led the way as Iowa Farm Bureau's president, and in a few short days, he'll be wrapping up his final term at Iowa Farm Bureau's annual meeting. Spokesman editor Dirk Steimel recently sat down with Craig to discuss some of Farm Bureau's most significant contributions over the years and to give us an update on some of the important issues Farm Bureau's working on right now as Craig prepares to hand the baton to our next president. Dirk will take it from here. I'm here with Craig Hill, president of the Iowa Farm Bureau. For those who don't know, Craig is wrapping up his last term as our president, which caps roughly four decades of service to Farm Bureau that goes way back to his days on the Warren County Farm Bureau Board. We thought it'd be a good time to talk with Craig about the mark that Farm Bureau has made over the years. So let's start right there, Craig, with a big question. As you reflect on your years of leadership here, what has been Farm Bureau's biggest or most significant contribution to addressing the challenges that agriculture faces? You know, there has been so many factors that have contributed to uh, the Iowa Farm Bureau overcoming its challenges. When I think about the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation, probably the biggest story may be those that came before us and how they invested in the organization financially. And we created some insurance companies, particularly a life insurance company that all of the income and dividends were reinvested over the years until the early 1990s. We began to harvest some of the income from the life insurance company then, and we've invested that in an endowment, which should sustainably fund this organization far into the future. And with this financial security that we have. It gives us the opportunity to serve members beyond what we would be able to with the very affordable membership dues that we have, that our 155,000 member families invest in us. So I think this ability to perpetually fund the organization and uh, our ability to hold uh, folks together in every county united in goals you combine that, and it, it makes Farm Bureau pretty powerful. Now, I would, Dirk, mention about the American Farm Bureau. I think a little bit different scenario there. The American Farm Bureau, probably their leading claim to their success is the ability to keep all of the regional interests and all of the commodity interests from around the country, all of the states working together. That's a huge accomplishment, and I would uh, give credit to the AFBF for doing that. Let's talk about some of the more recent challenges. One of the things that has come through with the Biden administration trying to fund its Build Back Better plan is some possible changes or potential changes to estate taxes and the elimination of stepped-up basis. What kind of impact would that have on family farmers, and how is Farm Bureau working to make sure that doesn't happen? Well... Consistently, over the years, this issue continues to emerge. Um, The removal of stepped-up basis, harmful estate taxes, capital gains taxes on assets that are transferred at time of death, all of these threaten the way of life of the family farm. 
It also threatens the next generation. In many of these cases, the farm family would have to pay for the farm, essentially, again, at the time of the passing of a grandparent or a parent. The Build Back Better proposal uh, had within it uh, increase in capital gains, stepped up basis removal, and many, many transfer taxes, things that really would have handicapped our ability to have the legacy of the farm that we currently uh, appreciate and enjoy. So Farm Bureau fought back, and we fought back hard. And I will tell you, Dirk, sure, there was coalition partners, but had it not been for Farm Bureau, you would have seen these tax measures in Build Back Better. Another big issue that comes up again and again are federal water rules. There's been a push by the Biden administration just recently to revamp the current rule defining federal waters. Why is keeping the current rule so important for Farm Bureau members and really for all of Iowa? Well, I think, you know, farmers have an appreciation for clearly defined rules that are consistent with congressionally approved uh, legislation, such as the 1972 Clean Water Act. But the Clean Water Act has limits, and a federal agency should not have the authority to control the use of land or to create new definitions not authorized by Congress. So we want clean water, and we want states' rights, uh, and we're more about conservation and improving water quality than about stringent rules that no one can really comply to. So again, if not for Farm Bureau, we may be living under that 2015 Waters of the U.S. Act, and today we're still working hard to ensure that the Clean Water Act is enforced as written. We've continued to see Iowa farmers take on the challenge of improving water quality in our state. A couple of years ago, the Iowa legislature passed Senate File 512 to provide more dedicated water quality funding. Why was that bill so important, and what will the funding mean for agriculture's continued water quality efforts? Well, farmers have a long history of significant conservation spending, and uh, we do that as landowners. Water quality uh, was becoming a rising priority amongst everyone, I believe, and after much study and examination, it was determined that we need a voluntary, effective, incentive-based nutrient reduction strategy. And that set the stage for Senate File 512. That passed the Iowa legislature and signed by the governor in 2018. And it brought with it about $270 million of dedicated water quality funding that will be extended over the next decade, beginning in 2019. One of the biggest success stories, I think, of Farm Bureau. And today, I think there's tangible results of this very big and bold initiative that was actually led by farmers Let's switch a minute and talk about trade. We know that trade deals, such as the phase one deal with China, are critical for ag. How has Farm Bureau worked to encourage the development of these trade agreements, and how has ag benefited from that? Well, I think uh, we found ourselves as farmers in the midst of a trade war. Tariffs were imposed by the U.S. against China, uh, items such as solar panels and steel and et cetera. But retaliatory tariffs were placed then on U.S. ag goods that were going to be um, sold by Iowa farmers, such as soybeans and other commodities. But it has been very helpful to be able to move these, these commodities across seas. And uh, we, we find ourselves in a place with high prices today, profitable prices, largely because of our exports. Finally, protecting property taxpayers has been a key focus of Farm Bureau for decades. Why has this been so important, and why are recent changes, such as the state shifting mental health funding from property taxes to the general fund, so important for farmers and for all Iowans? Well, the interests of property owners has been a key focus of the Iowa Farm Bureau for all the years of my involvement and beyond. And we're one of the few organizations that are looking after property owners and property taxpayers uh, as well. 
But we want, of course, a very effective uh, mental health service for Iowans. We want a positive impact on folks that need help. But we also want equitable funding. And where should the funding come from? Well, certainly not from property, which are intended to pay for roads and bridges and things that are property-related. But when it's people-related, there's probably other forms of taxation that are more appropriate. And we've had this that we've dealt with over the years. And finally, last year, the Iowa Farm Bureau pretty much single-handedly convinced the legislature and the governor to sign into legislation the uh, removal of mental health funding from property tax and place that into the general fund. This is equitable. It's affordable at this time for the legislature to do that. And another one of those success stories, the Iowa Farm Bureau. As we conclude here, Craig, I'd like to thank you for your leadership over the years. And I know our members and staff want to express their gratitude as well. Any final thoughts you have as we close? Dirk, a Farm Bureau is so powerful, so respected, and so trusted. And that comes about, you know, because we all pull together with one mission, and we stand united. We are generous as an organization. We give back to Iowans, our communities. And, you know, finally, our goals are always directed by our membership. But, uh, Dirk, I also have to tell you, uh, finally, it is a wonderful staff that work for the Iowa Farm Bureau, like yourself, Dirk. And I know that you're retiring just after the first of the year. But as editor of our love Farm Bureau spokesman, the diligent work by you and so many others, communicating agricultural story, uh, story of our people, our organization, uh, the work by yourself and others are so exceptional. You have too played a key role in our organization's success, and I want to thank you. On behalf of the organization, on behalf of myself, thanks, Dirk. Thanks, Dirk, and I'd also like to echo your thoughts by offering our thanks to President Hill for his service to the Farm Bureau over the past four decades. This organization continues to be a positive and influential force for farmers thanks to his leadership and we're in a great position to begin the next chapter when Iowa Farm Bureau elects its new president next week. Next up, we have Dr. Wendong Zhang, an Iowa State University economics professor who's also one of the premier experts on Iowa's farmland values. I'm guessing that everyone who's listening to this podcast is well aware of some of the jaw-dropping land sales we've been seeing around the state lately. Spokesman reporter Tom Block asked Dr. Zhang about what's fueling that boom. Wendong, we're here to talk about Iowa land values, which is an area that you study very closely. What's behind the sharp rise in farmland values we've seen here in the past six months? Yeah, so if you are going to the auctions, you will no longer be surprised when you hear the parcel is selling for $14,000, $16,000, because last week there were, uh, I think, $22,000 sales, $26,000 sales all over the place in Iowa. I have talked about this. The land value roughly equals income divided by interest rate. So the interest rate is capped fairly low and near historical low by the Federal Reserve in part because that there are drastic cuts in March 2020 to deal with COVID-19 uncertainties. So that definitely is a major factor. And in 2020, we also saw substantial CFAP payments that $46 billion of government payments injected into the agricultural economy. Uh, you'll be surprised how many people will actually be able to go there and buy the $15,000 per acre parcel 80 acre in cash. So income is higher and the com higher commodity prices, higher income and lower interest rates in general uh, push the land market stronger. And even though that the higher prices have incentivized some owners to uh, sell more acres, Overall, we are still seeing um, fairly limited supply, especially relative to the demand. 
And when you are looking at the recent survey evidence, and uh, there are some surveys are reporting about on average 26, 28 percent annual growth uh, in Iowa. You mentioned low interest rates as a key factor in the current land market, and that's something that we've been dealing with for the past several years. Expand a little bit more on that and how would higher interest rates cool the farmland market? Yeah, so this is a definitely an interesting to, to watch, especially now we are seeing the inflation has gone through the roof and the Federal Reserve is under a lot of pressure to do what the, in a way that what Paul Volcker did in the, in the 80s to in, increase the interest rate. And again, go back to the formula, land values equals income divided by interest rate. If we see substantial increase in interest rate, that not only means that financing will be more costly, will be higher, that we also will see the a return for stock and bond will be higher as well, which attracts the demand away from farmland markets to back to the more traditional uh, financial assets that tends to push down land values. So there are something to pay attention is that my colleague Chet Hart and I have done analysis that when you are thinking about the interest rate, the interest rate move made five years ago still have implications nowadays and probably for the next five, 10 years. This has long tail for the full effects of these consequential policy moves to be fully absorbed in the market. And even when the Federal Reserve decided to substantially increase interest rate, and they likely will, if they do so, they will increase gradually. Even if they decided to do so, they will send a downward signal, but it probably won't immediately show the full extent of the depressing effects because what we see in March 2020, the substantial cuts will be sub- providing the support for land market over the next decade. So these things have long tails. Yep. And I know this is an issue that we could talk about for hours. And I know you're preparing to release a lot more information on Iowa farm land values through the annual ISU land value survey. Tell us a little bit more about that survey, how the information is gathered, and a general sense for what farmers can expect to see when you release it. Right. I'm currently doing the land value survey, which is will be released on Tuesday, December 14th in the morning. And if you go to ISU card website uh, later that day, so Center for Agricultural and Rural Development, and likely in your local newspaper, you'll see the results being broadcasted. I'm proud to say this is a survey of the first of its kind in the nation. It started in the 1940s, and we have been using the consistent methodology since 1950. And this is still remains uh, the, the only information source that provides uh, county level land values of, uh, at an annual basis. So what you will be seeing is for each county, and you will see an average farmland value, not just cropland, especially in southern Iowa. And uh, this is the land values as of November 1st, 2021. So we'll give you a dollar a month. More importantly, I want you to pay attention to the percent growth. Uh, We forecast because of the momentum, we likely, many of the counties will see the record-breaking farmland prices that will top the 2013-2014 prices they have seen. So you will be able to visually see that. You will also be able to see not only this year's land value survey, but also the county-level land value survey uh, results since 1950. And in addition, you will also see information for high, medium, low quality for your crop reporting district. Uh, there are nine in a uh, nine district and 99 counties in Iowa. So look for that again. It's uh, December 14th on Tuesday. A shameless plug here is that if you are a farm manager, ag lender, and appraiser broker who are knowledgeable about your land market in your local area, and you haven't participated in our survey or haven't been annoyed by my repeat emails, please get in touch with me. Uh, or you can go to bit.ly slash land value 2021, and you can 
participate the survey there. We appreciate land knowledgeable experts like you to help make this possible for us to be able to release the local specific land value information. We appreciate Dr. Zhang joining us on the podcast, and we'll give him one more plug for his upcoming announcement. In the podcast notes, we've included a link to where you can find the ISU land value survey results on December 14th. Now, let's turn to our third guest in this week's episode, Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Mike Nag, who's here to talk about a grant program that should appeal to many of you listening to this podcast. Are you working to diversify the ag products you grow or how you sell them? Secretary Neg and the Department of Ag want you to apply. Spokesman reporter Corey Munson has the story. Thank you, Secretary Neg, for joining us today. Now, back in October, you announced the creation of the Choose Iowa Marketing and Promotion Grant Program. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about these new grants and fill us in on their purpose? Well, we're really excited to to launch this Choose Iowa Marketing and Promotion Grant Program. And and really the high level is uh, we are offering grants that will match up to $25,000 per project. And the intent here is to help farmers and businesses and nonprofits increase or maybe diversify uh, the ag products that they're offering. Another way that I've been thinking about this is it's also a way for us to try to shorten the distance between producers and consumers. And so these grants are, you know, it can be a, a business investment like equipment or, or technology or uh, anything that you'd need, frankly, to tap a, a new market or establish a new sales channel. And really, again, what we want to do is increase that availability and the ability of Iowa consumers to find more Iowa-grown products. So really excited about it. I think there's going to be some great projects that uh, that come in uh, via applications. Now, this feels similar to programs initiated in 2020 during the pandemic to help keep our food systems moving here in Iowa. Mm -hmm. Was that part of the inspiration for these programs? It was absolutely. And, you know, you go back and you think uh, I've been saying this is a way for us to try to bring something good forward out of 2020. And and we did uh, see a tremendous amount of interest in consumers wanting to shop local, wanting to uh, connect uh, to local and regional food systems. We certainly saw a disruption to the food supply chain uh, during 2020. and, And I think that was coupled with just this general trend of consumers wanting to know where their food comes from. And so it's kind of a convergence of those things. But we did see a tremendous interest in a couple of the programs that we offered that were CARES Act funded. We really were appreciative of Governor Reynolds for uh, allocating some dollars for us for the food space. We had a meat processing grant program that was very, very popular. We did uh, some things around farm to school, again, that were very popular. And then we had a renewable fuels infrastructure grant program as well. Those were the CARES Act funded projects that we looked at here. But you're absolutely right that this uh, Choose Iowa program is very much modeled on what we did with those CARES Act dollars. Are there specific rules as to what these grants can and can't be used for? There are, of course. And, you know, we're, we're trying to really keep these things uh, focused on new processing packaging or maybe uh, even some marketing technology, maybe an online sales system. Uh, And yet we've tried to keep this relatively broad, right? I don't want to be too specific because I I learned when I travel the state that there's lots of ideas. There's lots of folks looking at different products and and, uh, we don't want to be restrictive around that. So we we don't want to target these dollars too much to, to individual sectors. But we are trying to confine it to, you know, things that, again, will help establish or expand a marketplace. I'll I'll give a couple of examples. One would be perhaps a dairy farmer who's looking to invest in on-farm dairy processing or packaging equipment to sell cheese or yogurts in a grocery store or to a school or at a farmer's market. You know, that would be an example of what we'd like to be able to fund. Really, the only thing that's not eligible uh, specifically in this space would be around meat processing equipment because we have a 
sort of a parallel program running at Economic Development Authority specifically targeted for meat lockers and small meat processors. So we've ruled those things to be ineligible, not because they're not important, but because there's another program that's that's really targeted at that. So we would direct folks to chooseiowa.com for more information about the grant program. And, and some of these uh, questions are addressed in the frequently asked questions uh, section there. Uh, so why did the program get named Choose Iowa Grants? Kind of what's behind that? Well, it's actually, uh, we took an old brand that existed here at the Department of Ag off the shelf and shook the dust off of it. Uh, there was a Choose Iowa marketing program many years ago. And for a variety of reasons, it, it didn't exist any longer, but the brand is still there. And, and we're very interested in in resurrecting it and using it again. I think the timing is right for that. Again, because of what we've seen and the, the interest of consumers to buy local and the interest of uh, Iowa businesses and producers to sell locally. Uh, and so we think there's a great opportunity here. And so we, we've taken that and we've been using it kind of here and there. Uh, we've got a Choose Iowa calendar contest for kids at the Iowa State Fair. We've labeled this grant program with Choose Iowa. And uh, we're talking about uh, what it would look like to really grow this into, once again, being a very strong Iowa-grown labeling program. So stay tuned for that. I, I uh, intend to visit with the legislature about that uh, this upcoming session. Uh, now, we're coming up on the deadline uh, to apply for these grants. Uh, that's set for December 15th. Can you remind us of what specific information applicants need to have on hand when they go to fill out that paperwork? Yes, the deadline is approaching quickly, and, and we really encourage folks to go ahead and get, get an application in by December 15th. And, and uh, you know, the things that you're going to have to be able to describe is, is really at the core, how will this project or this grant help increase the sales of Iowa ag products? How does your business interact with farmers and the ag community? You're going to have to have a, a budget for your project, and you're going to have to show us again that uh, you've got match. We're, we're going to match uh, these grant dollars up to $25,000. We always are interested in leverage, and so we're certainly going to need evidence of that. And then we also want to be able to reserve these dollars for projects that'll get done in, uh, in a reasonable time frame, right? Because we expect that we'll have dollars again next year. We don't want projects that are going to take you know over a year or 18 months to complete because we can fund those next year. And so uh, we want to make sure that there's a reasonable timeline and, and that we can then prioritize to those projects that can get done within that time frame. So, and then of course, the end of the day, we're also looking for, can you measure the outcomes? Can you show uh, that these dollars invested wisely had the impact that we're looking for? And so that, that's the kind of information that you'll need to provide in your application process. But we're really trying to keep this streamlined. We know folks are busy and, uh, <laughs> They don't want to be sitting at a computer uh, going through a lengthy application process. So trying to keep it very smooth and, and streamlined and yet uh, know that we can say that these dollars were wisely invested. And remind us again, where do we go to learn more information on this grant? So the best place to go is chooseiowa.com and look for the grants program section where we've got information posted there, frequently asked questions and guidelines. And of course, our team at the Iowa Department of Ag will also be more than willing to answer any questions that you might have. And so again, you can find contact information there. Anything else that you want folks to know about Choose Iowa, the marketing and the promotion grants or anything else related to this program or anything else the IDOLS is up to? Well, this is a part of a, a series of things that we're working on here that uh, when, I, when I took office, uh, one of the key uh, set of issues that I wanted to work around were expanding market opportunities for Iowa farmers, and Iowa businesses, and that those can be very small businesses, very local markets or international markets. And we think that this Choose Iowa Marketing and Promotion Grant Program fits right in with that, that mission to uh, help expand and, and create more business opportunities for folks. So I'm really excited about it. I, again, as I've traveled the state, visit with a lot of people, I'm really encouraged by the creativity and the innovation that's out there. And this is just a small way that we can help to uh, de-risk trying something new. And I'm really excited to see what comes in in the form of applications and be able to make some announcements here after the first of the year. Well, it sounds like you're really offering a hands up to folks who may have those innovative ideas. And that's what we love to hear about is farmers making, making opportunities for themselves here. 
Absolutely. And you know, Iowa has such a tremendous brand for agriculture, right? Both here in, in our borders, but I think especially outside of the state of Iowa, people know Iowa for agriculture. And uh, if we can help uh, more of our folks be able to access consumers wherever they are, that's a great thing for us. It only strengthens our agriculture and it uh, absolutely strengthens the Iowa economy. So uh, again, really excited to be able to launch this, appreciative of the legislature and the governor for their support and uh, excited to see what comes. It's great to have Secretary Nag back on the podcast. And I think everyone listening would agree that the criteria for the new grant program that Secretary Nag just described is pretty broad, and it could very well describe your farming operation. If you're interested in learning more about that grant program, we've put a link in the notes for this episode. Okay, that brings us to the end of this podcast episode, but our next three episodes are just around the corner, and you won't want to miss them. Next week is Iowa Farm Bureau's annual meeting, and during that time, we're going to be recognizing three outstanding young farmers. Michael McEnany of Story County, Megan Craigle of Clayton County, and Court Holub of Tama County will all be receiving Iowa Farm Bureau's Young Farmer Leadership Award, and they'll also be the stars of a three-part podcast series that we'll be releasing on December 6th, 7th, and eighth. So, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to The Spokesman Speaks in your favorite podcast app, and be sure to join us next week. Thank you for doing the work that inspires everything we do here at the Iowa Farm Bureau, and thanks for listening to The Spokesman Speaks. Thank you for listening to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcast episodes at iowafarmbureau.com slash podcast. You can also find and subscribe to the Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and other popular podcast apps. We appreciate your ratings and reviews, and we welcome you to email us your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.